All right. I was told if I start, you would come. All right. I'm going to get started. Good afternoon. I'm Jay Esperance. I'm director of Wildland Fire for uh, Department of Agriculture for the state of South Dakota. And uh, we have three guests, but one didn't make it. So, uh, and I'll be introducing them more formally as we go down the, the line here. Alan Rowley from the U.S. Forest Service and Mary Zimmerman is here. And uh, who couldn't make it was Dave Steffen. And, uh, you know, I met him this summer. Uh, we spent some time together and I took pretty good notes. So I'm going to go ahead and just share some of the things that I think uh, Dave would have talked about. And the reason he didn't come is just some really bad road conditions and he felt it wasn't safe. And uh, he gave me a little heads up last night. And then this morning he just said he couldn't make it. So uh, Dave uh, was going to talk about, he's the vice chair of uh, mid Missouri river prescribed burn association. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that association. Uh, some of the pluses and challenges that they've had. You know, I think when we talk prescribed burn, we're going to probably hear a lot about burning, uh, prescribed burning in the Black Hills. Uh, and I know that those of you who joined us at the Governor's Ag Summit this uh, last summer, we was out in uh, East River. And so I spent a, a lot of time sharing my thoughts about prescribed burning for, for wildlife burning uh, out there in the East River. Uh, but... Uh, the subject that, that Dave was going to talk about is something even different that I'd like to share with you, and, and he would also. So, again, excuse my reading of notes, but uh, his main concern is the landscape changes in Gregory County over the past 35 years, and that's primarily from invasive species, but primarily of cedar is what we're going to talk about. And he, he called it the cedar glacier. You know, when you think about glaciers, either they're receding or they're moving forward. Well, in this case, they're moving forward. And I think that was the analogy he wanted to talk about. And uh, the one missing tool in managing cedar has been fire. Um, so the landowners got together. They actually did a poll of the landowners of Gregory County and I uh, wanted to know just what was their concern with cedar and it was overwhelming. There was a huge concern about cedar and so from that came the advent of 2015 of the Mid-Missouri River Prescribed Fire Association. And uh, I'm just going to hit some key, key points that I remember from uh, my visit with Dave and that's that he's gotten excellent and verbal support from federal, state, local units of government and uh, that included training you know and that's something uh, being part of an agency, you get liabilities uh, and requirements for training, but that was uh, something that we were trying to, to work out with our uh, friends from NRCS. Uh, he said also excellent support from all levels of various agencies for planning and executing of burns. And the Gregory County Volunteer Fire Assistance has just been outstanding. But there's some... Uh, some issues that they found also. Uh, they have not been able to find a good burn plan format that would uh, be able to, to work uh, to meet their conditions. Uh, they have conflicting support for, between management levels. Uh, the equipment that they need isn't always available for them at the time that they are ready to burn. Uh, the burn site prepar preparation could improve and that's stuff like uh, either prepping around the burn so it doesn't uh, doesn't go beyond the boundaries. It also is pre-prepping like shearing of the cedar so that they'll have, get it on the ground, get a chance to dry out and get a cleaner burn. Uh, so that's something that they're going to continue to work on. And then uh, lastly was uh, they believe that cultural resource preservation procedures need to improve. Uh, they feel that with proper planning, liability concerns, smoke issues, none of those are really issues. But uh, this is the way I look at it. These folks are, are ranchers. They only got so many acres to make a living. And I'm not going to try to make up a percent number because I don't remember. But 
let's just say a percent, let's say every year you're losing a percent of your, your land that is productive land so that you can make a living and hopefully a profit. And, and how long can these ranchers uh, sustain that, especially him in the cow calf business, which is going through a little bit of hard time uh, recently. So uh, that's something that, that, that I see is, is a tremendous issue. Uh, I brought it to Secretary Jasper's attention. And then also I was thinking about um, liability that's involved in, in prescribed burning and what if something does go wrong and so I met with Nanny Hansen over here. She's our agriculture uh, policy advisor and just talked about maybe some less legislation we can, we can propose uh, that could limit some of the liability concerns. Uh, finally, I think it, if he were to have a final comment, he would say that our association has been pleased with the support and encouragement we have received from so many of you folks that are in the room today. So on behalf of him, I thank you. Okay, we're gonna move right on down the road with uh, the speakers that are here. And uh, I'd like to introduce Alan Rowley. He is a director of rangelands management, vegetation, ecology from the Washington office of the United States Forest Service. And it's a great privilege to meet you and have you up here with us. Well, thanks. And I would also add, uh, for some of you in the last couple of weeks, I've also picked up uh, being the director of forest management for the agency. So I, um, everything, all the grass, everything that has chlorophyll in it would be in my portfolio, I guess. So um, the beauty of having me is I, I just can't ever talk for very long. I'll give you a thumbnail of uh, why we would even think about prescribed burning um, a small piece of our process to implement, at least on the National Forest System, and well, quite frankly, also all the other federal agencies use almost an identical process and identical burn plan, as we'll talk about. And some uh, closing thoughts, uh, stimulating um, bullets that would hopefully trigger some great conversation later. So I'll start with uh, the big why. Uh, the one that people talk about is always fuel reduction. And you think about fuel reduction, I always try and make it personal. Um, if you want your house to get really hot and you heat with wood, you throw in more wood. The more wood, the hotter it burns, right? And so that seems to make a lot of sense, except on the landscape, maybe we don't want something that hot. And so maybe we can do something in advance to, uh, with a prescribed burn to reduce the amount of fuel. And that applies on the acre we're going to burn for sure. I'd also, and, and I'd ask you to think about it. It also applies across the landscape. Because while we did something on this acre, 5, 10, 20, whatever the size is, we also have now created a fire break, a break in the fuel. We've broken the fuse at some scale across the whole landscape. So fuel reduction applies, one, on that acre, and two, across making a hole in the landscape. The second piece about why we burn is to, to take, um, you know, all the fire ecologists and, and all the hundreds of papers they publish every year and really summarize it into one thing. We burn because it can change the vegetation. It can do things like kill juniper and cedars, um, kill sagebrush in some cases or, or a, a lot of it. It could encourage uh, sprouting shrubs. You know, my friend Matt Mickle, a sheep permittee in San Pete County, Utah, makes a lot of lamb chops off of Snowberry. And a little bit of fire can help his business in a big way. So that's one of those tools. It has some other negative effects in terms of favoring some of those light seeded windborne species that we don't like, plant species like cheatgrass or invasive weeds like, uh, um, um, I just forgot it spotted knapweed. I started to call it bitterroot alfalfa, but it's really spotted knapweed. Um, sorry about that slip up for my friends in Montana. Um, prescribed fire also can be really beneficial and positive and stimulating bunch grass. And, and again, uh, I don't have any examples here out of South Dakota, but I know we make a lot of T-bone steaks on bunch grass and fire can really help that. And fire can set up that perfect seed bed for a new stand of something, be it conifers, uh, like lodgepole pine or ponderosa pine or Douglas fir, or a seed bed that's gonna be perfect for some other grasses or shrubs to get established. 
So I'm going to oversimplify all that fire ecology and say, you know, it comes down to two things we can do with fire. We can reduce the fuel of small scale and across the landscape. And two, we can change the vegetation through the influence of fire. So that's why we consider it. Particularly when it comes to that change of vegetation across the landscape, <clears throat> there are some effects of fire that we have not been able to duplicate with other means. Some things we have been able to duplicate or, or get close to. Fuel reduction, we can, if it, it was a 80 foot high ponderosa pine, lodgepole, whatever, we could cut it down, haul it to town and make a product out of it. And at the same time, reduce fuel. So there's, we could burn it or we could use it, right? So that, that fits. Um, there's some grazing management techniques where you can also change the vegetation. And there's some vegetation changes you, we haven't figured out how to do without fire. With that said, uh, let's talk about our process. It all starts with some kind of analysis of the effects and, and uh, analysis through um, usually a NEPA document. And that would give us the where and the why. Where would we be treating and, wh and what's the driver? That's usually with the um, complex, highly variable business of fire. That's still not enough detail to actually implement though. So we'll make that decision in a planning document. Then we'll have to write a site-specific burn plan. That's where it gets pretty tactical about this ridge, this road, these kind of weather conditions. There's a interagency burn plan that all the federal agencies use that also includes um, one of the elements is your notification plan. Who are you going to call in advance? Who are you coordinating with? Who are you sharing resources with? That's a requirement in that federal plan, uh, interagency burn plan. And then once those plans are done, there's nothing left to do but uh, strike the match and implement. So let me skip to uh, my, my uh, skip. Uh, it's time to go right to the, my closing points. And that whole business about fire management. I am not aware of a fire that does not have some negative effect socially or environmentally. Maybe it's smoke on the 4th of July in a music festival in Deadwood, right? can't avoid the smoke, um, somewhere so, there'll be that negative effect. So I'm not aware of how you implement a fire without having something like that somewhere. I'd also say that all fire, um, I, I, no matter how well you plan and how skilled you are, I would say there's not a no risk fire. You know, the weather will change, the wind will change, something will happen and, and you may have a um, bad outcome. And I don't know how to eliminate all that risk, except to plan as much as we can, right? I'd ask you to think about in my um, time in the Rocky Mountain West in particular, I've drawn the conclusion that um, it is going to burn someday. And our choices are when and can we influence it? I'm not aware of a strategy of avoidance forever that works. Lastly, every fire you have, whether planned or accidental, makes the next one easier. What's that about? Well, you've experienced a fire on your landscape, and so in the process, you become smarter about the weather patterns and the fuels and the lay of the land and those kind of details. You've experienced a fire on the landscape, and certainly in South Dakota is uh, well aware of this. It has forced you or or either for a wildfire forced you or for a planned fire, giving you the chance to practice working with your neighbors. And I think that's a good thing. So you're better prepared. You've, uh, you've already played uh, one inning or one game and we're ready to do it again because we know our relative roles. And the third part about why every fire makes the next one easier is now you have also 
accomplish that task in terms of fuels reduction. And you have a, a fuel break, a hole in the complex, a break in the fuse, whatever metaphor you want to use, you have a place you can start your next fire activities from. It'll give you choices you didn't have yesterday. That's all I have. I hope I a lot, lots of time for a question and discussion. Thank you, Alan. Next, I'd like to introduce Mary Zimmerman. Mary's an artist by training and profession. 1982, she graduated with an art and history degree. And Mary has worked through South Dakota and Arts Council and several decades as an artist in residence all around South Dakota. Uh, also, she's an amateur botanist, naturalist, and ecologist with specific self-driven study of the Black Hills flora, fauna, and ecology. Currently, she's serving on the Black Hills National Forest Advisory Board, representing a regionally recognized environmental organization, Norbeck Society. Mary. Thank you. Um, I want to say my first uh, impression when I walked in as an artist, my eyebrows went up because I think we need to talk about um, the types of shapes that we have here, what's round and what's square, and, and which shapes are made out of straight lines and which ones are made out of square lines or curved lines, because this is supposed to be a round table, right? Um, <laughs> but I'm seeing a square table. Um, I don't think it changes the way we, we can communicate here, however. Um, I've got a couple of ideas that I want to um, um, explain to everybody. I'm going to be throwing out some, some numbers. We'll be using percentages and um, degrees um, to describe two things, one being the character of our Black Hills Forest here, and the other to talk about um, the realities of climate change. And, and then I'll briefly talk about how the two are related. Um, so I've, I've done a lot of study. I've read the Graves Report from 1897 and talked to the silviculturist here on the forest about the characteristics that this forest had in the past and the characteristics that it has today. And, and I think a lot of you know that it's changed quite a bit. Um, we've done a lot in, in the way of, um, of vegetative treatments and a lot in the way of fire suppression. And, and we've changed the, the character of this forest. So if we look back about 140 years, uh, we had a forest that was probably about 40% grass, grassland, and um, probably a forest that was comprised of about 20% old growth. And then the remaining 40% being all of the stages in between. So um, seedlings, saplings spawn up through the, you know, what we call the structural stages um, to mature trees. Um, and also at that time, um, I think quite remarkably, the, the understory of that forest was um, clear and open. And that was because of the native fire regimen that, that went through the understory on average between um, 20 and 40 acres, depending on where you are in, or were in the forest. Um, and I think we had you know, great ideas and ambitions about um, making the forest more productive. We brought with us ideas that were kind of the Europe, European style uh, silvicultural notions for increasing board feet. And, and making this a better and more productive forest. And I think we did succeed in that, um, but it's also had the effect of changing the characteristics. So now if we look at that pie of, of the percentages of what this forest is comprised of, currently we're at about 8% grassland. Um, we're at 1% old growth, and then over 90% is the ages in between. And then most striking is what's in the understory um, we've got it packed full of, of trees of, of every age class um, underneath the, the main overstory. So we've got a lot of uh, fine fuels, both in the um, smaller trees in the understory, and then also with the, the debris and pine duff that's built up on the forest floor from um, now 140 years of many areas missing regular fire intervals that would normally clear that out. So um, that's brought us to a, a point where we have 
somewhat explosive conditions on the forest, lots of fine fuels and lots of ladder fuels. Um, so the other thing I mentioned was um, climate change, and I'll just use real rough numbers on all of this, but um, you know, with industrialization, um, roughly between 1900 and 2100, we're looking at a little over four degrees of temperature increase, and that's global averages. And um, we've already experienced some of that, and in the 80 years ahead of us, um, we're probably looking at, on our current trajectory, uh, about three degrees of climate change. Now, I'd like to contrast that with the climate change that's occurred in the past. Um, that same type of change of a little over four degrees um, has occurred in the past as well. But between um, 22,000 years ago and 1960, that's about the, the amount of time that went by with, with four degrees of climate change or warming, so to speak. So um, so um, there, I think there are things we can do about climate change and, and to the degree that we address that, that's going to affect the degrees of warming that we've got immediately in front of us. I think 80 years, um, most of us that think about land and land management, um, 80 years can go by pretty quickly. And we're talking about, um, you know, a whole forest. So um, I was asked to talk about um, um, issues that are before us with prescribed burning and, and solutions. And so I'll, I'll mention some of those um, here now also. Um, um, I, you know, I think that really what we're choosing, and this echoes a little bit what Alan just said, we're, we're choosing between fire and fire and, and it's up to us if we want to try to to manage it or if we want to have wildfire. So um, uh, issues are the um, funding issues and the focus of the, the lead agency here on the forest, which is the National Forest Service. Um, and then on, on the part of private lands and the public, I think we have a great need for education and also for the appreciation of the situation we're in and and of how prescribed burden can help us. And um, I think both of those, I think there is some good news on that front um, in thinking about today and, and solutions. I think we've got a really great template that we've developed and a, a structure um, for addressing the details of prescribed burning and the funding and in, in the effort that we've put forth to address the mountain pine beetle issues. Um, so I know that when people work together and work hard that we can find solutions. And so I think that we've been doing that and we just need to kind of change the name and the focus and, and keep working smart. Um, so I, and I think also there's a model in, in what we've done with the mountain pine beetle in the, the area of education and appreciation on the part of the, the public and the, the private landowners because I've seen those people follow the lead of the, the federal and state agencies in addressing the mountain pine beetle. Uh, I've seen a lot of private landowners address the fuels on their own private lands. And, and so I think that I think that they're ready to learn about prescribed burning and, and reduction of, of the fine fuels across the forest. So, um, and then of course there's the umbrella issue of climate change and I, I really think that there's no issue that we face today that's not affected by that. And that to the degree we can address that successfully and mitigate these temperatures from rising, that's the degree that we'll find um, ease and success in managing our, our lands, both private and, and public lands. And so that's, that's a biggie. And um, we're going to have to really work hard on that. Um, so um, I also on a kind of an optimistic note, I, I know a lot of the specialists, for, both that work for the state and the federal government here in this area. And I think we've got a tremendous amount of capability and knowledge and expertise. 
and um, so I think we need to, you know, really harness that and and move forward from here. Um, I've really appreciated the opportunities that I've had over the years to interface with those people, and um, also um, thank you for having me here today uh, with this opportunity. So thanks. Thank you, Mary. Uh, I was looking, Troy sent me on how to be a moderator on a panel, and I had to flag this and even highlight it. It says, be neutral and objective voice. If anybody's heard me speak before, <laughs> you, you know it's going to take a lot of self-restraint. But with that, let's go ahead and open it to questions and answers. So you're not going to take the first one? <laughs> Oh, come on. This one we could probably go for eight All right. hours straight. And, and Here we go. Okay. Let me start it off. Let me paint a picture for you here, right here in the Black Hills. <coughs> Historically, and, you know, numbers are whatever whatever they are. This is what I came up with. You might find some different, but, but I think I'll get my point across. Historically, before the Black Hills was settled, uh, the fire return interval, in other words, the fire would burn the same piece of ground again. Uh, in the northern hills, it was once every 40 years. Uh, in the southern hills, once every 11 years. Uh, the average for all the Black Hills is every 27 years. So what that was, it was a frequent return of fire at low intensity. Okay. Then uh, we heard some of the, the issues. Uh, Bob Paulson earlier today said we got 300,000 acres of uh, in holdings of private land inside those Black Hills. So we got to do our best. I'm required by law to put out fire. We got to do our best to protect those uh, those uh, in holdings. I, I get that, um, but we've really done a good job in fire suppression. So historically, we. Prior to settling, uh, it was 40 to 50,000 acres of burn a year in the Black Hills. Currently, average, and that's kind of a, well, I'll have to discuss that word average, 119 fires for 10,199 acres. Now, what's odd about the average is if you folks in Black Hills know, we could go five, six years with hardly anything, then we get that one big explosive one. So that, that number is, uh, is is a little different. I guess my point is is we're, we're each year we're getting at a deficit of uh, thirty to forty thousand acres, and uh, you know I heard uh, Jim Nyman speak, and I always enjoy listening to you. Um, and uh, he mentioned the fact that that uh, our growth is exceeding our harvest, and he also mentioned that it would take we'd need to take more. Uh, timber out of the woods to, to, to bring that equal. Well, I'll agree with that, but I also think there's other tools besides timber, and that is utilizing prescribed fire. And I also agree with the points that your panel had on the fact that, that uh, let's utilize what wood we can uh, and, then, and then come through with prescribed fire. But a lot of it uh, comes down to the, the dollar. You know, a lot of the the wood has very little value or the value that it has by the time you, you pay people to cut it and, and, and transport it and then turn it into to a product, it doesn't pencil out. So those are, those are some of the challenges we have there. Um, but just, just be thinking of all those numbers and how things have changed. And so, yeah, we are getting overcrowding. What does overcrowding lead to? It leads to catastrophic fires it leads to um, insect disease issues, and uh, and we've seen that. And yeah, there are some other things that I think are part of that, and uh, uh, I think it's very obvious, and it was mentioned here, uh, that our climate has changed, and that's, uh, that's even setting us up probably more catastrophic. Um, so yeah, we got we got some real problems out there. I don't know if I got the answers. I'm going to ask you all to talk amongst yourselves because you're the you're the people, you're the implementers, you're the policy people out there. Uh, I don't know. I mean, what do we do? We got to protect our lands. We have the smoke issues. We have uh, liability issues. Um, so all those things that we we need to talk about, we need to consider. Mary, I agree with you, 
in that I think education is a good first step. We need to educate our public on, you know, the old Pram uh, oil commercial. You know, you can pay me now or you can pay me later. And generally, that's really what it is. You can get a little smoke and a low intensity prescribed burn that if we do it right, it shoots it up in the upper atmosphere and we get it out of there versus, uh, um, you know, a wildland fire that's going to be impacting a community for months. Uh, so th those are those are all issues. I don't know if I have a perfect answer. Well, I don't. But uh, we have set ourselves up to for overcrowding and uh, insect and disease. And and I really salute the uh, Black Hills National Forest and in their uh, their management. They've done just an, an outstanding job. I had the opportunity to work in forests all over the Western United States. And I'm really proud to be associated with this forest. So I'll just use that as a kickoff and uh, let you guys talk amongst yourself if you don't have questions for us. Uh, Mary, I'd like to talk about climate change for just a second. Not that I totally buy into it or put all the cause on industrial, but that's just from, from your perspective. Assume that I am concerned about it and want to learn more about it. When I look at the Black Hills uh, a number of years ago, and of course, when I was educated in the early 70s, we were talking about going into uh, uh, a cooling period. Uh, and a lot of the perspective is measured around the 60s and 70s and looking at that last 50 years. So I was glad to hear you talk back longer time frame. We also talked a number of years ago about going back to the range and natural variability, which you referred to what the landscape looked like, which I appreciate 140 years ago before settlers hit here uh, in the 40 percent, 40 percent and 20 percent. Looking at where we're at today and looking at uh, as soon as we start lock, looking at going back to the range of natural variability, and of course, in my mind, my, I lit up because I thought, wow, if we're going to go from 5 billion board feet back to 1.5 billion, I've got a future for quite a few decades. Mm -hmm. uh, but if I look at climate change from the perspective of if we have a longer growing period because it's going to be warmer, are we going to grow more ponderosa? That's going to partly depend, are we going to have more moisture or less? So if I'm a rancher, I got a degree in range management, so I think in simple terms of what is the carrying capacity of this forest, create a healthy forest. So if, if we have dry, warmer conditions, how do you look at what this carrying capacity would be and how do we deal with that? And then, and I also agree with, with Jay, and how do we bring in um, the perspective of um, the, the whole realm of, of inventory and, and how do we take care of that. So talk about those yeah. two examples, if you would, both if we have longer growing season and dry or wet and how you look at that and what our inventory should be. Yeah, I think that's a great question. And I think if I had the answer, I'd be rich and famous. But um, I can't say I do. Um, I, I will say that um, I'm not advocating that we go back to exactly what we had 140 years ago. Um, a lot has changed. For one thing, I don't think we're all going to just leave. <laughs> um, but if I could bring up Goldilocks and the three bears here, um, I, I think it's going to be a, a balancing act. And I think it's going to be juggling many, many complexities. And, um, and of course, all of these complexities are dynamic too, constantly on the move. But I think we need to kind of hedge our bets in every direction because we don't know what's going to happen. You know, if, if we're going to be wetter or drier or, um, well, probably we're going to be warmer. But um, I think that's in the details that we have to muddle our way through in the years to come. What, what, what else do I need to address, Jim? <laughs> Does that cover what you're asking me? Yeah, I, I think you're just helping add on, on both perspectives. Mm -hmm. it, it's going to take a lot of us sitting down and talking through because those yeah. challenges when you try to figure out what is that future desired condition, what do we want, mm -hmm. I clearly buy in. We need to use both the timber industry and prescribed burn, mm -hmm. but 
there's a bigger picture coming in front of us. Yeah, and we are in the middle of the continent, and I believe that that's a, a, ge a geographical situation that's inclined towards um, big swings. So, mm -hmm. you know, we could be some of both. Um, and I'm a big proponent, and, and I love that Troy brought it up first thing this morning about the big picture and the details, because I think that they're both equally important. And, and so I, I, we've got a lot of talented, thoughtful folks, and, and we need to figure out how we can do it. Well, you're highly respected for your big picture thinking, so I was trying to dig into that a little bit. <laughs> I might just add on to that. This conversation triggered a couple of thoughts that I think are, I think they're worth sharing. You can draw your own conclusions. One is this notion of uh, when we look at those historical records, the Graves report uh, or other things, and then dear Jay paint the picture of the change from 1897 to today. As a natural resource manager and hence an internal optimist, it's also important to me that I not um, that I look at that for information, but not for evaluation. So what's that mean? It means I shouldn't be critical of my predecessors because they came to work just like I do. They came to work to work as hard as they knew how to at that point in time. They didn't come to work to thinking, I'm going to screw it up. That's my goal today. Nobody comes to work with that attitude. So we all got here together is the point. And to be able to go back, um, I think Mary artfully described going back to 1897 uh, probably isn't possible, right? Because we got a bunch of people that live on this continent and other places that weren't here in 1897. Um, so it's that notion of looking back to see what we can learn and about systems. And that's my hope into the future of, so what do we do in the middle of the continent where we would forecast large environmental swings? Um, what is the future condition? I, the word I would use is, can we build some uh, resiliency and options into our system? Can we manage in such a way that um, we're not prone to large insect and disease outbreaks? Can we manage in such a way we're not prone to large fires so we have choices? The, uh, the analogy I, I would give you would, is, comes from uh, North Dakota, north of here in Burley County. They have uh, many small uh, farmers and ranchers in Burley County um, have converted from traditional small grains to a grassland-based uh, beef production system. And they've become pretty uh, well known in the ag industry. When they plant a field for forage, they plant uh, warm season grass, cool season grass, warm season forbs, and cool season forbs. They might plant 12 different species in one planting. The old way is to plant one or two. They're building resiliency. Now, the analogy limps because it's a one or two year cycle and it's, it's a ag production. But there's a concept there about, I'm ready, no matter whether it rains, snows, or not, one of those 12 or 14 species are going to grow and produce something for me. So can we take that metaphor and apply it to the management of uh, the rest of our natural resource estate in terms of uh, uh, the forest, Black Hills, and the rest of South Dakota? Um, we're prescribed burns concerned. I think we're kind of preaching to the choir in this room a bit. I think that everybody, everybody gets it, or at least most folks get it, I hope. Um, so what we're talking about more is fuels management, which brings up the whole firewise concept, considering the interface we're dealing with in the hills. And we, we at the BLM, we fund um, a couple of veterans crews. One works out of Meade County and one works out of Rapid City. Um, to work with landowners in the hills and, and work on their firewise issues around their homes to prevent, you know, the, a catastrophic fire from taking their house out. So is there something that we can do as a group, as all of our agencies um, and, and, and private folks, to promote the firewise program and 
eventually get to a point where prescribed burn is less of a threat and we do have more availability for it. And I don't know that anybody, that's job. kind of for the group, yeah, I guess. I, I hope we're doing that. Uh, I'd take it a bigger picture and uh, I look around the room, uh, several people shared a podium with me uh, just a couple, about a month ago now on cohesive strategy and, and working on uh, resilient landscapes and, uh, and the cooperation and coordination of working together. And uh, I think that's a vision that we need to, to make come true. And uh, again, I look at around the room and I know there's a lot of people in here that are on board with us on that. So, but that is one part of it. Yes, thank you. Greg Gilston, uh, the State Forester for South Dakota. One of the things that uh, that we enjoy here in the Black Hills is a pretty solid social license for doing management work. Um, we don't get a lot of lawsuits against the National Forest for uh, for doing the management work, particularly since mountain pine beetle uh, problem arose here. But uh, I guess I'm going to. I'm going to go with this is to play a little bit of the devil's advocate. Um, we, we also see a lot of smoke in the air uh, here in the Black Hills, uh, pile burning, especially in the wintertime when there's snow on the ground, uh, and, uh, and prescribed burning. There's been a number of prescribed burns here in the, in the hills uh, this fall. Uh, and I think, uh, I think, by and large, people accept that. The problem that I see is when things go wrong. And uh, you know, historically, uh, I can think back, you know, in the late 1990s, um, there was a prescribed burn up in the hills and uh, uh, they were holding forces on that prescribed burn overnight, but they weren't adequate, the fire got away, burned through a subdivision and quite a large amount of rangeland, uh, private rangeland, and, uh, um, the consequence of that was uh, prescribed burning got shut down for years. Uh, it was felt that the risk was just too great, apparently. Uh, heads rolled, you know, people lost their jobs. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, like I said, the consequence of that was prescribed burning was shut down for quite a few years. Uh, state prescribed burning, federal prescribed burning, uh, everything just got shut down. Uh, People were, people were scared. Uh, the, the fire managers were scared. You know, what's going to happen? Uh, you know, who's got my back if something goes wrong? Um, and, uh, you know, liability issues are always there. Uh, you know, we know about the, the prescribed burn that got away up in, uh, um, uh, up in the national grasslands up on the uh, South Dakota, North Dakota border. Um, and as I understand it, the, uh, you know, there was a lot of private lands that were burned over and the private landowners didn't get anything uh, as a result of the damages that occurred up there. So it, it would seem to me that, um, that there would need to be, if, if we really wanna move forward with prescribed burning, uh, there needs to be an acceptance of risk on the part of, uh, on the part of everybody who could be involved. Um, fire managers, um, you know, they're, they're the ones who are taking on that risk when they go out there and light that fire, because quite honestly, in the back of their mind, somewhere in the back of their mind, they're, they're thinking, if this gets away, my career is ended. Okay. The, the person who makes the decision to go ahead with the burn, uh, if that burn gets away, their, their career is probably over. Uh, you know, that's, that's a pretty heavy burden to put onto somebody when you're trying to promote a management activity. You know, we don't, we don't have to worry about uh, uh, that with a, a, um, a logging operation. You know, if, the, if it goes across the border, yeah, that, that logger is going to have to uh, to pay some restitution to the, uh, the private landowner, but he's probably not going to be put out of business unless he makes a habit of it. Um, but all that a, that a fire manager needs to do is lose that burn, lose a burn once, and he could very well lose his job. Um, but on the other hand, those private landowners that suffer losses, um, you know, I think that they're entitled to some kind of restitution too. Uh, 
you know, if they have, uh, you know, they lose a lot of rangeland, I mean, uh, that can put them out of business. Uh, they could have to sell off their, uh, their, their cattle because, you know, they don't have any, any uh, uh, grass to, to feed their cows with. Uh, you know, if their hay uh, storage goes up in flames, um, you know, that's a, a huge hit to those people. And, and so it would seem to me that if we really want to get on the road toward, um, toward using fire and having acceptable fire, we need to have an equitable, um, an equitable liability system where people can be reimbursed for their losses through escape fire, but, uh, uh, you know, uh, fire managers don't need to be so completely gun shy about, uh, about starting a fire. Um, so I'll throw that out there for people to chew on and, and to comment on. Uh, A little, a little precursor to the next panel too. This feeds directly into the, a culture that's created as well. There's a risk aversion in the culture of the agency because of the, this, and this is one of the really important points that people in the agency all know. And I think it bleeds, that, that kind of risk aversion because of the, what Greg was describing bleeds into other aspects of what the agency does as well. I just want to toss that in. Uh, just a quick response to what Greg said. Uh, Dave Thom, Custer County Conservation District and Mountain Pine Beetle Working Group. In the in the wildlife business under the Endangered Species Act, if grizzly bears or wolves take an animal, uh, a rancher's calf, there's some provision for uh, depredation loss. And I don't know how all that works. It's some private entities, but nonetheless, there's a a payment to that landowner for the public good in uh, helping to maintain those populations. In the same way, Greg's suggestion is that there's some system in place that in the rare event that a fire gets away, a prescribed burn, that there ought to be some acceptance that relatively quickly evaluate that, that burn and, and get on with making those reimbursements, much like we do for other public good sort of deals. So I think that's a reasonable suggestion, Greg. Mark Elgin with Senator Thune's office, and I'd like to give Greg a hug. So, no, that uh, goes right along with what uh, we've had working, the senators had working in his office. And one of the things we just like to point out is that while he totally appreciates the value of the prescribed burns, and we all do, and when when uh, this was brought up as a result of the Potray fire up north that you were talking about, um, you know, one of the things the the Forest Service told us was that only, I think, uh, one half of 1% of their prescribed burns ever get out of hand, which is very commendable. And to which we said, well, then it shouldn't be a problem to reimburse those who have, whose land you damage. Uh, they didn't qu quite see that that way. So we continue to work at something and we came very close. It's probably not gonna happen this session, but probably the next, um, we just have to find a way to pay for it on reimbursing private landowners who have damage. Because you know, if they start a fire and it damages Forest Service land, um, they get a bill within uh, within a couple months, and expected to pay it. Um, one of the things when they said one half of one percent of uh, the fires get out of hand, you know, that's very good. But then you, we asked them to put numbers to it, and how many how many fires have there been that have gotten out of hand, prescribed burns that got and damaged private property, and what kind of dollar value? And in the last 10 years, just with the Forest Service, not the other land management agencies, there were 122 fires that got out of hand. And that accounted for 80, I think about $85 million in damage to private lands. Of that, once they go through all the process, less than 4 million was ever paid to the claimants. Now that doesn't count another 70 million that is either in um, courts now or on its way. So half of 1% or one-tenth of whatever, whatever it was um, seems pretty small unless you start figuring out that your ranch or your hay was among that 150 million um, that was lost. So, so very good point and I think it will be addressed soon. Yeah, just listen to it as a private landowner who's 
adjacent to forest lands. I appreciate your point. It'd be great if you could do something. But it does seem to argue for more small controlled fires. If you can keep showing people what can be done, and along with the downsides, um, it almost seems like you're arguing for maybe not as large of areas as we like to hit, but the more times you can show smaller areas that it is controlled, that it does do, what, and even when you talk about making your pockets, you know, that then you have a starting place to go from, it still seems to argue in your favor of more, maybe smaller burns, um, but and well controlled, keep people's confidence, get people's education level up, but it sure seems to argue for it. I wish you well, along with the downsides that we you know, hear about, and we, uh, you just go on the Wyoming side, I got neighbors, ranchers that lost a lot of ground over there. Uh, Wyoming's not that far off. In fact, you talk about not far off, this very area uh, burnt in 57, uh, 1957, showing my age. Um, this whole area went, and it was not a prescribed, it was a fire that got away. It was a trash fire that got away and lost big chunk of back hills. But you look at it now, 60 years later, there are wonderful forests around here. So. Um, Along with all the downsides, I hope you guys can stay at it. Whether well, rotating to the next question, I'd, um, as I think about, um, this is the third round table in Troy, I think three more to go that are west wide. So, I might say the Black Hills has it pretty good in terms of social acceptance. Other places in the West, not so much. And so that might be a thought as you move forward. What, how, can we, how can we expand this? There are places in the West where uh, if you ask the public, yeah, it's summertime and it always burns, not a big deal. You know, I can, I can name those on one hand. Wouldn't it be great if that was wider spread? Well, just <clears throat> something I was uh, that I'm not real. We well, haven't haven't thoroughly researched out, but many of the members, the landowner members that we're working with, with Western Landowners Alliance, have been looking into. Um, if I understand it right, some of the states like Texas, Alabama, Georgia, Florida, the insurance companies are getting into this business of providing insurance per event, you know, insuring groups of landowners, you know, adjacent landowners when, when something like this happens. And as you said, with the, and I guess probably the reason they're looking at it was, is with the small percentage of fires that do get away, there may be some money in it, you know? And I, I guess I would, I would suggest that perhaps Western landowners could, you know, could try to promote the idea of you know, pooled in interagency funding to deal with training, to deal with um, developing burn plans, um, and, and even in starting to look into some of the liability issues. There may be, you know, there may be a way for the public or the business to help deal with some of that as well. Before we go, I got a shameless plug. This education bit, Mary, I agree with you. And uh, in coordination with uh, my friends, uh, State Game Fish and Park and Rapid City Fire, we're going to do a burn right in the middle of Rapid City, a little nine acre burn, have all or inviting all the press. And uh, it's part of the education. And by golly, it better go good. <laughs> so be waiting to see that early spring. Um, Tom Troxell, Black Hills Forest Resource Association, an interesting discussion. Um, and fire and, and logging or timber harvest are, are really two tools to, to get to desired conditions. And, and so it's important for us to have it figured out what are the desired conditions, what are we trying to accomplish? I, I, I think in some cases, there, one tool is better than the other. I think in a lot of cases, they are complementary to each other. Um, 
And I guess just an open question to folks around the table uh, that, that have thought about this, but, but what, what's really the limiting factor to doing more prescribed burning in the Black Hills? Is, is it this risk question? Is it a money question? Or is it, is it something else? If, if, if we really want to do more, how do we approach that? Got a district ranger sitting right next to you. He can probably speak for the forest. Uh, Steve Kozel, I'm the district ranger uh, in uh, Sundance, Wyoming, on the Bear Lodge Ranger District. Uh, getting at uh, Tom's question here is, I think it's a combination of both. Um, why don't we do more? I think one of the things, what I experience on the north end of the forest, uh, our windows to achieve our objectives uh, in our burn plans are, are very small. And you got to hit those perfectly. And uh, you got to be ready to go. Um, many times we're probably rowing from wildfire season that's been pretty intense um, and then all of a sudden we have a weather change and we're in prescription to go in light why we were just putting them out and so from a social acceptance sometimes you're not going to do that um, you, it, it just doesn't make sense um, the other is risk um, as a disc ranger uh, when we uh, sit down and go through the burn plan. We go through the planning, um, the organization, um, and then we get to the go, no go. Um, if we're off, you know, there's, there's a lump in my stomach, just like Jay said, I hope it goes right. Um, because we do think about our neighbors and potential impacts and the unpredictable weather that we have here in the Black Hills. Our weather forecasts uh, here in the Black Hills are, what would you say, Jay? Right, about 20, 30%. <laughs> they're, a per, they're a prediction. The, uh, the National Weather Service does a good job, but we have a lot of local terrain-driven winds that um, really influence what we do. And so we got to be cognizant but as Alan mentioned, though, too, is if you do one, you learn with your partners and you build some confidence and you learn from that and, and you move forward. But getting back, um, there's a lot of institutional knowledge experience here where you're talking about the Horse Creek fire that got away that impacted the, the subdivision. I believe that's what it was. Maybe it was a Newberry. I, I, I can't recall the name, but that knowledge and that experience is alive and well on this forest. And people remember that and the consequences and the impacts that it had on private homeowners, private land. And so that goes into a lot of thinking too, whether we get the green light from, you know, the forest supervisor to move ahead and so forth. So I think it's a combination of both. It's, it's the windows um, and it's us as line officers making that decision whether we go or not. Sure. So let me Tom. ask a follow-up question, because it, it seems like um, that this fall would have been a world record best ever fall for doing prescribed burning in the Black Hills. And, and there weren't a lot of prescribed burns. So are, are, are we maxed out there? Is, is, is what we did this year the most that's ever going to happen? And if so, should we just accept that fact and not fool around with it? Well, I can tell you, Tom, uh, we've been burning pretty aggressively with the state and uh, primarily in Custer State Park. We had a pretty large burn. Uh, we started and you might have thought it was good, but it was on the hot end of the prescription and we had to end up calling it uh, when we only got it half complete. So, uh, yeah, this time the weather wasn't in our favor, in the favor that it was was. Uh, was too, too much on the hot end of our prescription. But go ahead. On the north end of the forest, we couldn't get anything to burn. <laughs> we couldn't. Um, we tried two or three times, and you thought the, the conditions were perfect, but we had enough rain in August and September that we had green up. I had green grass about this high on the ranger district, 
and I couldn't carry fire at all. We tried twice, we couldn't do it. Um, the Central Hills were probably a little bit better, more conducive, yeah, they were they more within uh, prescription, and as you trend toward the south end of the forest, you're probably out of prescription. So um, that was probably why um, not a lot was done on, on the forest. Um, in addition to, uh, there was some thinking, um, there was a large wildfire east of Rapid City that burned, I don't know how many tens of thousands of acres. And so, um, you know, we were thinking about that as well. Um, the, the impact from smoke and, and again, seeing fire after something that tragic happened uh, to those folks that live east of Rapid City. So there's differences across the forest in terms of prescription. There's also um, capability issues too. Um, probably when we're in prescription, a lot of other uh, units are in prescription as well. And so we're competing for resources yep. to help us um, in trying to get the resources in to do the burn, um, hold it, patrol it, um, we may not be able to get those um, in a timely manner. So that was some of the reasons. Um, you know, a few years back, uh, probably in the mid 2000s on, on my ranger district, the most we did um, in that time period was about 1,500 acres. And that's a lot. Uh, people would drag and drip torches um, and, and you start wearing out people after a while. And um, so we gotta be cognizant of safety uh, safety is a big thing when we're looking at uh, what we're doing. So, um, so that's some of the reasons why I come. I want to uh, look forward a little bit with Steve's discussion of, um, so I don't have the particulars on the Black Hills. I think there's a long list of things on any given day you would identify as a, as a constraint, be it getting through the planning process, uh, the funding, risk aversion of escape, uh, risk of uh, or cautiousness to not um, overly impact the social setting with more smoke when you already had a wildfire and people are oversensitized and we wouldn't want to put people over the edge with the prescribed burn. So people are thinking about those kind of things. Um, and our prescription windows are small trying because we're trying to get the sweet spot so my challenge is um can we get out of that rut somewhere those ruts a friend of mine uh, one of my employees said you know a rut that's a it's a coffin with both ends kicked out um so what do we do different so i worked with a f my uh, fire crew and i i actually couldn't turn them but I had this idea, go up in that watershed above town, send the saw crew up there and tell them to put down a quarter acre of trees. Just put them on the ground because we weren't going to build a road there anyway. And then let's go up there and burn them in November with fresh snow, right? Red needles. And so we, we'd burn a bunch of quarter acre pockets all across the landscape. I couldn't get people to buy that notion. You know, I failed in terms of that motivation because that's not how we do prescribed burn. So, so Tom, maybe maybe we, um, with the collaborative group on the Black Hills, you you do both. Maybe you identify a bunch of patch clear cuts, and maybe then you identify some patches where, you know, it's submerchable or however we describe it. They're going to be small. We're just going to build a big pile of stuff we can burn when there's snow on the ground to open up that window, right? And that would take all of us to own. So that's one crazy, that's one idea. Actually, I'll label it crazy to save you the effort. Um, <clears throat> but there's gotta be some other ideas out there like that. To open can, that window, make it bigger. Can I add to that? Um, you know, my idea when I'm talking about working smart, um, I'm actually a private landowner within the Black Hills National Forest as well. And, and um, indeed have had a, uh, well, I've reacted both to wired wildfires and I've also had a prescribed burn directly south of my property. 
Um, but when I talk about working smart, it's that exact idea. So the land south of me on the Forest Service was burned in 1997, you know, just about 20 years ago. And, um, and it, it was suddenly the most safe border that we had from wildfire. I mean, I love it. And I love what happened to the vegetation. This is just incredible transformation of that land. And, and I'll say it was logged first in about 1990. Um, I live on the area that's case one. Um, in fact, my homestead was case one before it was homesteaded. Um, but that land south of us um, is one of our best fire breaks in the case of a wildfire. And my idea is it's, it's approaching what would be its regular return interval um, here in the next 10, 15 years, um, maybe 30 years, or what did I say, 10, 15, or 20 years, <laughs> sorry. Um, and, and when land is relatively safe from fire in the moments after it's been burned, you know, I'm talking about years later, but um, you know, why can't we build on that? So start a fire a little lower and burn into that you know, and continue on through it, take it into through its next cycle and add on to it or, or start there where it's relatively safe and, and add on to it and build on that. And that's where um, paying attention to the details and every little bit of the local conditions in any given area is really critical. That's gonna take people that really know every given patch of land that we're, we're addressing. I'll have to say there was another burn marked for me, uh, prescribed burn north, and um, I watched the Forest Service bulldoze the line a couple times, put out their little rack of sticks, and it just never got to the window, and it sits there still today as, you know, what I would call a pine desert, which is what I had south of me before. Um, so, um, you know, it can't always be done, and if I I just feel like I can't overemphasize the, the factor that climate change has in, in this, and that's that the windows of opportunity that we have to take these conscious planned efforts for prescribed fire are gonna become less and less as our climate heats up. We running out of steam? Oh, we got a hand up. Who's next? Okay. Craig, hi. Okay, got it. Okay, cool. Thank you all, panel. So, you know, I, I was reflecting back on when this uh, increased call for prescribed fire has been documented for decades. And I think the first cohesive strategy was around 99 or 2000 that came out and identified this big gap. And I thought, and there's some very good ideas here today. And then I heard there's legislation being drafted. Some others have ideas on legislation and so on. And there'll be some a bunch of grassroots groups and collaboratives that'll be working on this, and that's all good. But in terms of the role of the Western governors or beyond, what is a way on the forum that some best practices are state of the art on how to increase prescribed fire, um, whether it be through legislation reducing risk, whether it be for best practices, co-op sharing of resources for narrow windows to burn, and all that? Is there a role for the Western governors or beyond? To, to feed back to places like in the Black Hills with all, the, all of these states that you represent and where these best practices could be um, learned about, understood, and hopefully applied. What I'd jump in with is I, what I would love to see from uh, you guys, I, I think you take it for granted how uh, amenable you are to, to, to using fire as a tool. And uh, so pull back from that and I'd love to dig into your brains and figure out, well, what are the conditions? What, what is going on here that, that sets up that kind of dynamic? And, and then the harder question is, can it be replicated? But that's one thing I'd love to, for you guys to think about is what is what's unique about Black Hills that lets you that gets you to that point. Um, that's one thing. Uh, and two other elements here that I think would you guys would be really helpful on. Um, 
just thinking about the how compensation ought to work, and I, I, I hope Mark, you know, and Senator Thune have taken care of that. But and but that would be for federal land, and so for uh, private property owners that that choose to engage in a, in a burn um, or state lands that are involved that's something that you guys take care of with state law and so what does that look like and what what does that yeah what, what does that look like the third thing is that I'd love to figure out is is there is there a template or what are the elements of a responsible liability uh, protection scheme for if you're the one that's taking the right steps and and doing everything right, going ahead with your burn, and then uh, something just doesn't go right. Um, so, what are the elements of that kind of of that scheme so that people aren't as as we were talking about earlier, so that people don't have that risk aversion to doing the right thing and whether that's a federal land manager or a state person or a private landowner. Um, all need that all need that protection or something at least that gives them a little more breathing room in terms of of utilizing fire as a management tool. So those three, good? We can knock that out in the next 10 minutes. Last one. Well, this just kind of builds a little bit on what you were talking about. You know, probably almost everybody in this room drive, drove their car to get here. And when we did that, we took a risk. Most of us have insurance to cover that risk. Um, but for, for prescribed burning, at least on the governmental side, we don't have insurance other than self-insurance. So I don't know what it would look like, but if we had some kind of a, you know, risk protection through insurance, that might be a way to address this issue both for governmental entities and private landowners as well. And perhaps you somehow contribute to that um, in some way. I hate to end this discussion, but at the same time, we could we could talk about it for like six more hours and, and have not covered everything we could have. So, um, but the really good, good start to that. And I'm not kidding. I want you guys to think about those, those three questions. Um, because in terms of what the governors are looking for, it's those kinds of solutions are what they need um, in terms of how to get from here to, to where we want to be. Okay. Um,